know, once again, it's a privilege to go into this pulpit. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. This sermon is not mine. I didn't get it off the Internet. I didn't borrow it. I didn't plagiarize it. It came to me in the Hampton Inn, 270 miles from here, at 3 o'clock in the morning. Good thing it wasn't wasn't on my hotel bill. So, before I start this, now that I know I have a lot of time, what would you rate yourself as a Christian on a scale of 1 to 10? How about trees? Sunday school teacher, been in a way a long time. John, you've been a long time. You are 10? You know it's good to know what you are. Right? It's really good to know what you are. Because if you know what you are, you know what you can be. Right? So this evening, I have some scripture. And I have a thought in here, Pastor. I'm going to give it to everyone right now because I want you to think about it while I'm preaching. I've never heard it from a pulpit in my life, John. This is the 44th year of ministry that I've been in. I've never heard this. I've never heard this, Pastor. The majority of Christians have laid off the Holy Spirit. That's pretty deep, isn't it? The Holy Spirit, Odie, has been unemployed in some Christians' lives for years. And that's why they live like they do, below what God has called them to live. Put that first scripture up for me, brother, would you please? The name of the, the, name of the sermon is, I Need a Makeover. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. I'm going to start out by something, making, making a radical statement. I'm going to propose that we, do, that we give our best to Jesus every day in every way. I know that's radical. No one's accountable anymore. Pastor preached about it. It started right in the garden. Adam said, Yeah, you did it, God, you gave. That's the woman. You made all this issue. We're accountable, folks. We're accountable. And this evening, if you want to have a better year, it ain't going to be through anything but through God's grace and mercy. You must become better to have a better year. You can't buy it. You can't get it. You're going to find it on your knees. And when you get on your knees, you'll get on your feet stronger than you went down. I could feel a preach coming on this evening. I want to talk about things in our physical lives that are affecting our spiritual life. That's what I want to talk about this evening. Put that next one up, see you. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Do you know gym attendance is up? And do you know the church attendance is down? There's some kind of parallel there. The gyms are packed. The churches are empty. There, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. These, uh, these people, uh, there is such a premium placed on looks. You know, I heard a guy say, have you ever seen an ugly guy with a handsome, with a really beautiful woman? No. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, these people that star in movies, those ain't normal people. I, I ain't seen one of them women in West Union yet. 
I ain't seen none. Even in Walmart don't have them. And Walmart got about anything you want. You can see all kinds of things at Walmart. Some things you don't, you don't want to see. <laughs> You're like, ah, Lord, anoint my eyes. Take that, take that memory from me. Huh? There's so many, there's so many people that they're leading men and leading women. Some of those women have so much silicone in them, you could patch a hole in the boat. And these guys, they've had their nose sharpened, they've had this move, that move, uh, and, and just had these makeovers. They eat certain food. They have certain gym tendencies. They go and they have trainers and, they, and all that stuff. You know why? They're selling a product. You know why people advertise? It works. You know, as a business owner myself for a while, when things are bad, John, you don't cut back on advertising. You do more advertising to sell your product. What product are we selling in this church? Jesus. We're his advertisement. And he don't want a bunch of ones and twos out there advertising for him. He wants tens out there advertising for him. He wants a return on his investment. There's the investment. He bought you, John, that ramshackle shack that you call your body. He bought you as you were. And you know what? God don't like living in shacks. That's why he cleans you up a little bit, fit for a king. Each and every one of us, that ramshackle shack, he bought it through the blood, and he wants a return on that investment. That's what he wants, Pastor. He wants to live somewhere where it's worth living into. Back years, there was a show. Some of you will remember it. Some of you won't. It was called The Swan. Anybody remember it? Remember it? They would take a homely woman, Pastor, one that you wouldn't look at too long. And they would take this lady, and they would take her for six months. They'd fix her teeth. They'd make her lose 262 pounds. They put gym, gym, gym stuff made her. They enhanced her. They made her, they made her look like she was a movie star. And then they would have her back of a screen, and the family would be there, and they'd pull the screen back slow to build up the excitement. And when they finally saw their wife, their mom, their teeth fell out. They didn't know who it was. Now, I know men can do a lot of things for men. But if men can change the outside like that, surely the Holy Spirit can change our inside to be as beautiful. I would think. I would think that if we could do that with people, that we could probably have the Holy Spirit do it like that too. Put that next one up, see you. Finally, brethren. You know, it's funny. You guys always think when we preachers say in conclusion, we're about done. You guys are hilarious. <laughs> you watch it next time, Pastor says, or CEO says in conclusion. There's another five to eight minutes coming. We're never done when we tell you. Finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. The way we think determines how we live. How many of you have heard that? You are what you eat. There ain't a cabbage sitting in here. I ain't cabbage in here, see you. We are not what we eat. We are what we think. And we are what we are because that's what we want to be. That's what we want to be. You know, on the way over here before uh, I left home, you know what I was listening to? Symphony. I like symphony music too. You know why? They're professionals. There's something about good music, man. 
and I watch those guys on the strings and the flutes and the cellos and all that, and it sounded so good. And my thought was, they just didn't get like that by being messing around. They're invested into it. What if we were so invested that this congregation had such a harmony with God that when people came in that were lost, they could hear God singing to them through us? This mind, that's a battlefield. The strongest battlefield a Christian has is right between the ears. That baby right there is either a treasure chest or a torture chamber. It's, one of, it's where flesh and spirit collide, right here. Right here. You know, that's wonderful. It's wonderful that God saves our soul. But if our mind doesn't link up with that, it's going to be a rough ride. It's called stinking thinking. And stinking thinking leads to low living. And we need to we need to think the way the way the way God wants us to be. You know, you know why we have such a problem with being a Christian? Because you were a sinner for so long. You know how hard it is to break a habit? Huh? You know how hard it is to break a habit? There's Christians, maybe in here tonight, you can't get rid of that cigarette. Seriously. You can't, oh, thank you, Jesus, I can't give it up. You mean to tell me the Holy Spirit can't help you get rid of a cigarette? You better tell somebody else, I ain't believing that. I can come smell your fingers and get you. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit sitting up here with a, with a cigarette in his mouth. A deck of cards, one of those hats on that you deal cards with, and, a, and, a, and a, I'll, I'll tone it down a little bit, light beer. Not the hard stuff, you know, give him a little grace. Just a light beer. I went one time, Montine saved somebody from intense fellowship. I'd only been saved a little while, Pastor. I didn't know you were supposed to not act dumb. I thought you were supposed to be excited about being a Christian, you know? I went past this church and it had BYOB on there. Bring your own bottle. I stopped the car, CO. I jumped out, Monty said, no! I went in and I said, who's running this place? There are people like, what do you mean? Who, who put that sign up? Well, uh, the father did. Get the father here. God saved him. He wasn't there. I was going to have intense fellowship with that guy. I just don't think that we, we need to be dabbling in the world stuff. I'm going to tell you about drinking. If you never drink, you don't have to get off of it. The best way to stay out of things is not get in them in the first place. That's why it's so important to bring those kids here. See that, that, see that one little boy today practicing for the Olympics? Who was that little kid? That little kid was getting it. I was thinking, man, I'd like to run like that one more time. Huh? He's just round and round and round. I'm thinking, that's exciting. And every time he went past you guys, you smiled. You smiled. Some of you ain't smiled all week. Some of you, I got to turn you upside down and get a smile on you. Huh? The mind is the battle. The mind is the battle. And the physical always has, a, has this upper hand because we are sense-driven. Touch. Sight. Hearing, taste, feel. I mean, we are such a sense-driven people. That's what excites us. And then you talk about spiritual. Uh, I've never seen Jesus. I haven't seen him, Pastor. 
I've been in this 44 years, and I ain't never broke bread with Jesus personally. I've never been able to do that to him yet. I could do it with him. I could do it with him. But I can't do it with Jesus. You know why? He's above me. He's supernatural. I'm still natural with this little bit of little bit of special in me through the Holy Spirit. And I have to learn how to shut that physical feelings off and go by the fact that the Bible says I'm a child of the king. I don't have to live off the garbage of the world anymore. I don't have to be excited about the things that I, I want. Paul said it like this. I'm content in what I have. What we ought to be content is not that we're not getting what we deserve. There's no one ever going to walk in heaven, John, that deserved to be there except Jesus Christ. This is our family. You know how the devil hates his church? Hates that pastor, that, that pastor's wife? He'll do anything he can to smear them. I know all about it. And you have to be careful out there People that come to West Union Christian Church and Christian Union, however you guys say that thing. Because it reflects back on him. And then it reflects back on him. We must be in a constant state of readiness for the things that are thrown our way. It never stops. Can you believe that you guys that are still working, CO and some of, some of you people still working out in the world, you, you associate with filth all week. You need to come here. You need to come and come and get things right, Odie, because you're hearing things you don't want to hear. You're seeing things you don't want to see. And it's good to come back and, and get under the, under the flow again. These altars are not off limits. You know, we preach our hearts out. And we know when we've preached a good one, or we know when we laid an egg. We know that. But let me tell you something, how good God is. Even when we lay an egg, he can bring something good out, out to, to you. Put the next couple up. See you. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man. Yeah, I'm going to pester somebody with this one. But that which cometh out of the mouth, that this defileth a man. Next one. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And one more. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. I think I'm going to talk mostly to the men on this. I, I, hope, I hope you women don't have a mouth like a man. I hope you don't have a man mouth. I don't know what school people graduated from that had every word start with F. I don't know what school that taught that. Our little grandkids, our four little quadruplets, 11 years old, come home, and you know what they tell me? Oh, Papa, I heard the word F a hundred times today. You know why? They're hearing it at home. There's no doubt in my mind that most men are leading their children right into hell. These men, we men are accountable for our families. No one's accountable anymore. Someone made you do it. It's not my fault. We need to be so careful what comes out of the barrel of our mouth. Because when you shoot that thing, you ain't getting it back. And now instead of shooting people with our mouth, now see, oh, we're shooting people with our fingertips on the Internet. And these young kids are committing suicide because someone said they're too fat, they're too skinny, they're not, half, they're not pretty enough.
I've heard things that by the grace of God, I have not responded and plucked someone on the head. You know, when we grew up, most of us older folks in here, you watch what come out of your mouth. Because if you didn't, by the time you woke up, your clothes would be out of date. Be very careful what we say. Be very careful. Our tongue weighs two ounces. No one can hold it. Just for curiosity, say, ever said something you wish you had back? Has anybody? Has anybody ever said something to you that you still know today that hurt you when you were little? Come on. Come on. It scarred you, Terry. And it's always from someone that loves you the most. The things we say, we ought, to, we ought to put a governor on our brain so what comes out of our mouth is easy to take. We need to engage our brain before our lips go off. I've, you know what? Especially about preachers. Boy, you know what, Pastor? And you don't look like you'd be good to eat. Not, I surely wasn't good to eat. But boy, people have preachers for the supper. Supper and lunch all the time. That's that person that's, that's, that has given the responsibility of seeing you make it home to heaven. Instead of praying about him, you need to pray for him. It's, you know what? The story was told of this guy. He was going to divorce his wife. He's going to divorce his wife, and he went to an old pastor like Pastor Lord. He went to an old pastor like this. And you know what the pastor told him? I want you to love her like you've never loved her for three months, and at the end, get rid of her. By the time that three months was up, he was so much in love with her, he couldn't stand being without her. Be careful what we say with our mouth. Everything is recorded now. They got you. You think you're getting away with something? There's a phone. There's, a, there's a, something looking at you. But beyond that, you may be lucky. And the phone may be dead. You may be lucky. And that, 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 that camera's turned off. But you're not so lucky that God didn't see it. God got his camera on all the time. Be careful. Be careful about that tongue. If we would talk better, everyone would be better. Everyone would be better. You know, uh, those of us that have had children, grandchildren, do you know they know when you're upset? They know when you, you're not happy. That two-year-old baby, they're not having a good old time. Writing on your wall, peeing on your carpet, chasing the dog around. And you're like, quit that! <laughs> the way you said it broke their spirit. Be careful. You know, if I had it all to do over again, and I'm just going to say me, CEO, because I got issues too. I was a baseball guy. I wanted the kids to play as good as I could. That was my issue. We need to be careful with young Christians that we don't put more on them than God has given the grace to use at that time. That's good preaching right there if you got that. 
And I said something to my son. And I saw I heard him. I pray that he's forgotten it, but I have. Be careful, CEO, what you do with those two precious boys. Because they're not going to forget, brother. Want to take it back, huh? There was a very, very famous man, and at my age, I forgot who it was. But I remember the story. Very busy man, very wealthy man, had one son, spent hardly any time with him. Remind me where I'm at, because I'm going to tell you a personal thing that happened to Montana and I. Our little boy was sick. I was out doing something. It was snowing. Montine calls our pediatrician, Dr. Deary. Tells him what's wrong with Thomas. You know what he said, Pastor? Where do you live? Remember? He said, where do you live, Mrs. Barnhart? She said, well, why would you want to know? It's snowing. I'm coming to your house. That doctor worked on our son on our living room table, Pastor. About 12 years after that, I'm talking to him in his office, and he said, Tom, I've watched your son's career in golf. And every time I saw him, I saw you. He said, you know, I have a son too. And because I've been so busy, I've never one time passed ball with him in the backyard. Made me cry. Good doctor, wasn't he? Good doctor. But he knew he'd missed that opportunity. He missed that opportunity. There's opportunities to come maybe once in a lifetime. Each time we come into church service, it's an opportunity that will never come by again. Back to that original story. Very wealthy man. Had one son and didn't show him any time at all. I guess he was guilted into it one day. He said, son, would you like to go fishing? The boy was ecstatic. He took the little boy fishing, John. When the little boy came home, he ran upstairs in his journal, and this is what he wrote. Best day of my life went fishing with my dad. Some years later, after his father had died, and he was cleaning out the drawers, he found that journal, the dad's journal. And he opened that page up to where he was, and here's what the word said. Wasted day fishing with my son. Be careful about those words. Think it through before you let it out. Next one, Cecilia. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Clause, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted Colossians, you know what, go to Ephesians 4. Go to Ephesians 4, I'm sorry. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that may, I think we did that one already. We did that one. Oh, okay. The last one says this. Put it up. No, put up uh, Jeremiah 18.14. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. 
Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. When we come to the end of services and we offer an altar call, you don't come to bless us. You come to bless God that he may bless you. Now, some of you this evening, I told sister, we're not going to sing a song. I don't think, I don't think a song was sung to coerce Jesus to go to a cross, Pastor. I don't think there was a choir, oh, let's see if we get Jesus excited enough, maybe he'll go to the cross. I don't think that was it. I think he went to the cross because he loved us. And that's what an altar call is. Do you love him enough to come without being prodded and pleaded with and not nudged forward because, you know what? Physically, I need some help. Okay? The way I talk, I need some help. The way I think, I need some help. The way I act, the way I talk, and the way I do now should not be the way you used to. When people that haven't seen you before your conversion and see you now, they ought to go, wow. What happened to you? Like CEO said, couldn't believe them two people got saved. No one can withstand the conviction of God if they come to the potter's will and let God do his work. But we're so set in our ways, we fold our hands and say, better than you have tried, I ain't coming. Don't come. Stay the way you are. I would probably think that most of us, including pastor, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Every altar call should be filled with everybody in his church. If it's just to thank him. When was the last time you went to an altar? I'm just thinking. Just thinking. When was the last time? I know people say, well, I come once. Came once. If you want to change, it's only one way. Through the grace of God. The mercy of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've had the Holy Spirit laid off for a long time. And he's, he's sitting there twiddling his thumb saying, if you give that to me, I can handle it for you. If you give me that issue, I'll make it non-issue for you. Now, I don't think I'm going to tell you that God's going to handle everything you want it to be handled. God's going to handle it the way he thinks it should be handled. And when he does it that way, you're going to be better off for where he gets the glory for it. So this evening, I'm done. We had an old preacher used to say that. I'm done. It's in your, it's in your court now. Right? It's, it's not up, I've, done my, I've done my job. I told you what God told me to tell you. So if you're a four or a five and you want to stay a four and a five, stay in your seat. If you want to move up a little bit, you want to become higher up on, up on the food chain where God can get more out of you than you ever got out of yourself, you need to come and say, thank you, Lord. I need help with my mind. I need help with my tongue. I need help with this or that. You're welcome to come right now. I'll give you a couple minutes. You're welcome to come.